Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. This time we're going to be looking at a novel written in 1993 by John Stiff called Manhattan Transfer. This novel was a Seoul Award nominee in Japan. Before we start, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up and subscribe and let's get into it. Our story begins just outside the orbit of Saturn and 40 degrees above the ecliptic plane, a wormhole opened up and out of that wormhole came a large black ship. The wormhole closed and the ship took a while to orient itself. It turned around until it was pointed towards Earth and that's where it headed. When the ship got to Earth, it headed for New York City. Meanwhile, in the borough of Manhattan, it is rush hour and people are headed for work. The helicopter was headed from the Midtown helipad to JFK with six passengers on board. It was over the East River when it slammed into a beam from the ship above, killing everybody on board. The A train was under the river, headed from Brooklyn to Manhattan with Matt Sheehan on board. He had taken the trip from JFK using the subway. The train was almost to Manhattan when the car shook violently and there was a series of explosions and the lights went out. With the screams, of people and the lighting of matches and cigarette lighters so they could see in the dark, Matt noticed that the back half of the subway car was gone. Matt jumped down to the track bed and noticed a man lying there. With help from others, he picked the man up. The man was missing his right hand, which had been cut completely off. He looked back and noticed that the tunnel where the subway car had just come from now ended in a black wall. He and the other survivors grabbed the injured man and headed for the nearest station. Rudy Sanchez was in his office at the municipal building when he noticed out the window a black craft that was shooting a laser and pellets out at the shoreline. Then the ground began to rumble and the lights went out. Abby Tercer was on her way from Grand Central to the UN building when she noticed that there was a black craft just behind the UN building shooting the laser down into the East River. Then she began running towards the UN building. All the lights, traffic lights were out. Rudy, looking out his window, could see that the Brooklyn Bridge had been cut in half, as were the trucks and cars that were on it. Many cars had fallen into the river. The black craft he had seen earlier was back and it had others with it and they seemed to be putting a transparent membrane or bubble over the island of Manhattan. Julie Craven, who works for WNBC and was in the same subway car as Matt, was one of the survivors heading out with that group. And as she's recording everything with her camcorder, she noticed that the ground began to shake violently and she got the feeling that you get when an elevator is racing upward. Dr. Bobby Joe Brewster, who worked at the Columbia University Computer Science Department, woke up at his desk. When he woke up, he noticed something was different. He went to the window and looked out, and he noticed that there was something black overhead, and that he could see New Jersey. He could see the roads in New Jersey, and he should not be able to see that. When Rudy Sanchez looked out his window, he could see that the island of Manhattan was in a bubble and that some enormous ship was lifting it up into the air. He watched as the Atlantic Ocean disappeared and a black shape above blotted out all of the stars and then all of the light as Manhattan moved into the shadow. Doreen Underwood was mayor of New York City and she watched events transpire from her office window at City Hall. Manhattan was dark except for the lights from the cars that reflected off of the dome. She also realized that they were in lower gravity, something she tested by jumping. Matt and his team of survivors got to the station, climbed onto the platform and made their way out of the station. When they got out onto the street, instead of daylight, it was dark with the lights from the cars reflecting off the sky. As they stood there looking around, the injured man opened his eyes and said God told him what to do and passed out again. Just then, a bright light rose to the west of the city and it was about the size of the sun and in a short time, 
the entire city was as bright as daylight. The dome then began to become transparent and they were able to see out and they noticed that the island of Manhattan was now resting on a vast gray plain and in the distance were other domes sitting on the same plain. They put the injured man into an ambulance then watched as large hoses came down into the bubble. Doreen was pleased that lights were provided because it meant that whoever took them was not going to kill them, she hoped. She sent a messenger out to gather the rest of her team so they could begin an emergency meeting. Julie headed to her office while Matt headed to the municipal building to meet his friend Rudy Sanchez. Rudy took Matt along to the mayor's emergency meeting. At the mayor's emergency meeting, they decided that since the aliens were providing air and water, they were going to have to find a way to tie the water into the city systems to provide water for everyone. And since there was a message placed at the top of the dome, presumably from the aliens, they were going to put a team together to try and get that message translated. Rudy was in charge of getting the water tested and hooked into the city systems. So he immediately set about doing that. Matt was in charge of putting together the translation team, so he headed to the UN to get some translators. Matt met Abby at the UN. She was a cultural anthropologist who was moonlighting as a UN translator, and she agreed to help him. So they headed back to the municipal building. The next set of hoses to come down into the dome provided electricity, so Rudy, who had already set up teams to get the water into the system set up teams to hook up the electricity into the city power systems the next set of hoses that came down were providing pellets that were obviously intended to be food Matt Sheehan called Julie at WNBC to set up a video message from the mayor to the city and also to borrow some video equipment so he can take it with him to the top of the World Trade Center. At the mayor's conference, she explained everything that was going on. She explained that water, electricity, and food in the form of nutrition pills were being provided by the aliens, but they still didn't know what the aliens wanted with them. She also asked for anyone with special skills in translation to volunteer so they could help translate the message that the aliens have put on the top of the dome. Dr. Barry Joe Brewster, upon hearing the mayor's message, called to volunteer his services as part of the translation team. Matt had set his team up on the south tower of the World Trade Center on the 105th floor, where he could not only observe the message at the top of the dome, but see the other cities that were domed all across that gray field. And from one of those cities, a message seems to be coming into them. The next series of tubes to come down would destroy anything that went into it. They now had a way to dispose of the city's waste. The dome that was sending them the signal was over 50 kilometers away, and they set about trying to decrypt the signal. Barbecue was able to decrypt the signal, and it turned out to be a video signal, and it showed the moment when an alien species had their city ripped out of their planet and how thousands upon thousands of people died in the process. In the mayor's next broadcast, she gave them the progress of the city and informed everyone that they were trying to contact other domed cities and also interpret what the message at the top of the dome was. When Stuart Lund heard the mayor's message, he got upset. Who was she to try and interpret God's word? And who was a bunch of scientists that were trying to interpret God's word? Only someone of religious faith could do so. Back at the World Trade Center, they had put together a video that detailed the taking of New York City and was transmitting it back to the dome that the signal came from but they had received no answer. They also were not having any luck translating the message that was on the top of the dome. At the next council meeting, Matt proposed that they send a small team out to contact 
other dome cities so that maybe they can get more information that way because they've tried sending signals and got no answer and to do that they'd have to cut through the dome first they tried going through the dome itself but nothing they tried worked then they decided to try beneath the dome apparently the dome was attached to a black substance when it got below the bedrock so they went down the battery tunnel to where the tunnel ended to the black wall and there they tried to breach that they finally succeeded in getting through the black wall using a magnetic field to soften it on the other side of the black wall the gray material had a consistency of madelin clay and all the tests showed that it was just as safe. It turns out that that gray goo would run after a while. So in order to tunnel through it, they would have to stiffen it. And they could do that by heating it. Meanwhile, Stuart Lund was preaching to his congregation that they were in Noah's Ark too and that God would put them back on earth as soon as he scrubbed it clean once again. And he was railing against the scientists and the mayor for going against God's will. They began by digging their tunnel a meter under the surface. Then Rudy created a borer to make the digging easier. It was 10 days after the capture that Matt and his small team were ready to head to the dome city that was sending the signal. Going with Matt was Abby, Bobby Joe, and Rudy. They got to the first domed city and could get no response for all of their signaling. So they cut their way in and went in to take a look around. This dome city's sun was blue. Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, Stuart Lund was getting a bit more upset that the mayor was allowing people to leave Manhattan to go to other dome cities. And he figured this couldn't be allowed. So he began to ask his congregation to disrupt things. Meanwhile, back in the dome city, Matt and his small crew found that all the beings in that city were dead, having committed suicide. After reporting back to Manhattan via Wadi Talkie, they left that dome city and headed to their next target. Being in that other city, they were able to find out that the clear bubble material stopped their signals, but the black material below didn't stop it, just slowed it down. The next dome city they reached held a trio of very large trees and in the branches of those trees hang vines or ropes and on them was a city. After trying to communicate with the aliens through the transparent dome, they dug their way into the city and were met by 40 aliens. The aliens looked like emancipated humans with a bad skin condition and big white eyes. One of the aliens gestured for them to follow and led them up into the tree city. Abby took the lead in trying to communicate with the aliens. In the center of the table they were sitting at was what looked like a magic slate that they used to write diagrams on. When Abby turned on her tablet to facilitate communications with the aliens, the aliens reacted in pain. She quickly turned it off, but by then one of the aliens had collapsed. Communications continued the original way and through that she learned that the aliens have been in captivity for about a decade Earth time. Apparently that species were telepathic and the final thing she learned from them was that about 20 days after they were captured, everyone on their planet died. They heard or felt them all die. Back in Manhattan, two men, Benny and Lucky, placed bombs in the water tunnels under the battery tunnel to flood it and stop the tunnel going to the other dome cities. The bombs went off and the battery tunnel got flooded. Back with Matt and the team, they had just left the telepath city and were back in the tunnel speaking to Manhattan when the signal cut off. Matt decided that he and Abby would head back to Manhattan while Bobby and Rudy with the borrower would keep going towards the city where the signal was coming from. On their way back to Manhattan, Matt and Abby came to a section of the tunnel that had collapsed. They managed to screech through and continue on their way. When they got back to Manhattan, they noticed that the battery tunnel was flooded. The guard that was there was dead, but the water level was slowly dropping. Matt and Abby had an emergency meeting with the mayor and the rest of the city government. 
At the meeting, Matt and Abby explained that it seems that after a city is captured, the rest of the planet is destroyed. And while they had no idea if Earth was already destroyed, they figured that they could put a team together and somehow break out of this area where all the cities are in, find the propulsion unit of the ship and disable it. They may be able to save Earth or maybe buy Earth some time. On the way back to meet Bobby and Rudy, Matt had two new members of the team. He had Julie Craven, who was the reporter attached to the team, and Richard Wilcon, who was a demolition expert, and they came with a car full of bombs and other explosives. They met up with Bobby and Rudy and kept pushing forward on their new extended mission. Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, the mayor finished briefing the city on what was going on. When she was finished, Stuart Lund was speaking to his congregation, railing against the mayor and others who were trying to stop God's will. When he was finished speaking to his congregation, the two men that flooded the Battery Tunnel, Benny and Lucky, went to him and offered their services. And since flooding the Battery Tunnel didn't work, they were going to turn their attention to the mayor. Back in the tunnels, Math and his team have reached the domed city that the signals were coming from and have entered it. The sun that this city was under was moving very slowly indicating that these people had a very long day and a very long night. The buildings in this city looked like cones and they found one that had a transmitter on top of it and that's the one they entered. Back in Manhattan, while the mayor is trying to calm the fears of some people on the council who was having second thoughts, Lucky was in his apartment creating a letter bomb to be mailed to the mayor. Back in the alien city, they finally found one of the aliens that was operating the transmitter, but he seemed to be either in a deep sleep or hibernating. Bobby made a calculation based on how slow the, their son was moving, and it seems that one of their nights was equal to somewhere between 20 and 30 of our days. They left the city, updated Manhattan, and headed to the wall of the enclosure. When they reached the wall and started drilling through, they had to bypass a red gas alert system, and when they finished drilling through, they found themselves in a passageway that seemed to run the entire length of the ship, and it had beams running from the inner hull to the outer one. They swung down those beams, which were about a yard apart. When they looked up in the passageway, they could see it receding up in the distance, not seeing a top. And when they looked down, they saw what looked like a shiny floor. So that's the side that they headed, jumping from beam to beam. It was when they got close that they realized what they thought was the floor was not. It was an area of zero gravity where all the dust had collected and their beams from their lights were shining on the dust, making it look like something solid. Once they passed through the ZWG area, directions changed. What seems like down, now seems like up. They finally came to a door with four handles set on the inside wall. Matt and Rudy managed to open it, and they stepped in. Back in Manhattan, the letter bomb that was mailed to Doreen, the mayor, was opened up by one of her assistants and it blew up and killed him. Elsewhere in the ship, Matt and his team was in a room that had an observation panel that looked down on the cities on the great plain below. A quick look showed them that Manhattan wasn't there and that meant that the great plain had two sides and there were cities on both sides and Manhattan was on the other side of that plain. They found what looked like an elevator and got in and after figuring out the buttons, took the elevator to the Manhattan side of the ship. Since that side had more cities on it, they figured that's where the bridge would be. When they finally got out of the elevator, there was in a room that was about a hundred kilometers across, and it was filled with strange machinery. As they were crossing the room, they saw in the distance a monorail car coming towards them. They hid, and when the car went by them, they could see inside there was two creatures that looked a little like spiders. The aliens had a single eye on a stalk and eight legs, four in the front and four in the back. And when they walked, they seemed to use only the middle four legs. After the aliens had gotten into the elevator and left, 
Matt and his team headed for where the biggest machines were. As they were crossing, they came across a observation port and looking down, they saw the Cone City and Manhattan. And Matt was able to contact Manhattan and send down information and video that they had taken. They finally reached the machines. These machines reached from the ceiling to the floor and they went inside one of them and Richard set up some of the explosives. They set them up on a 10 hour timer and they quickly left. All of the monorails seemed to converge toward the center of the ship and that's where they headed. They took to call in the spider looking aliens, Archies. Finally, Matt and his group came upon what looked like a maze of large kiosks. They were situated in such a way that you couldn't see inside them, but a few of them had a black band around them. Matt went over and looked into one with a black band and came back. He said that there were Archies sleeping in them. They found one without a black band and entered it. The minute they did, a black band appeared around its base. Back in Manhattan, Benny, Lucky and Stuart were making plans to set explosives at the top of the Empire State Building as a threat to get the mayor to back down. Elsewhere in the ship, Matt and his crew were in the kiosk trying to figure out how to get the computer that was built into the desk to work. The kiosk also had a bed in there and they took turns sleeping while one guy stood watch. Meanwhile, Bobby and Abby were taking turns trying to figure out the computer. They got into it and they noticed that it was based on pictures. Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, Benny and Lucky got into the Empire State Building and placed their explosives on the 90th floor. Using the pictographs on the computer, Abby and Bobby were able to drill down until they could take a look at Manhattan from above. Just then, the Archies figured out where they were and captured them. The Archies took them to a different room and separated them from the equipment. Then one Archie brought in a paper with a drawing of Manhattan and then it also had a drawing of the machines that they destroyed and put it in front of them with a marker. But Matt refused to cooperate. The Archies left and then came back with a bowl of nutrition pills and a box with eight switches on it. And then they went to the computer and made sure that the humans saw what they were doing and then they left again. That's when an Archie appeared on the computer screen and began speaking. Abby figured it was a language lesson. Abby, using the Archie's computer and her own, were able to create a crude language translation program that allowed her to figure out the code to put into the box that called the Archie's back into the room. When the Archie's returned, Abby used her translation program to talk with them and they told her that they were not the ones who were destroying planets. It was someone else. They were just trying to save as much of the people on each planet as they could and that the ones that were coming to destroy Earth would be here at any minute. Back in Manhattan, someone called the mayor and told her that the Empire State Building was set to blow up and she needed to cancel that expedition but they ran off just as the police got there. Matt then bluffed the Archies into getting onto the bridge of the ship. When he got to the bridge he noticed that the ship was still in orbit around the earth and the moon from the displays. Back in Manhattan the police found the explosives and verified that the caller was not lying. Back on the bridge the Archies told them that the ship that's coming is automated and that it jumps into the system and destroys the planet and then it jumps back out and their ship have no weapons so they can't fight it but they have to wait until it jumps so that they can jump ahead of it to save as much as they can when it jumps that's when they can tell where it's going the ship doesn't really destroy the planet what it does is begin the terraforming process that process kills everything, every living thing on the planet. With the Archie's help, they connected them to Manhattan. The mayor held an emergency broadcast and told everything that she received from Matt up at the bridge, and including pictures and video. And Stuart and his congregation realized he was wrong, and so does Benny and Lucky. Back on the bridge, 
they watched as the planet shaper, as they called the other ship, came into the system. Apparently, according to the Archies, the planet shaper comes into a system and targets only certain types of planets. And in this system, is looking for Earth and Venus. On the bridge, Matt was busy trying to bully and push the Archies into doing something to stop the planet shaper. But the problem was, the Archie ship has no weapons and the Archies on that ship were not fighters. Even the lasers that were used to cut away the cities from the planets would be ineffective against the planet shaper because it was designed to reflect lasers like that. Then they got the idea to use the dead city and throw it at the planet shaper. Eight shuttlecraft took the dead city, maneuvered it, and then sent it towards the planet shaper. The dead city connected with the planet shaper, creating a small hole, but the ship was able to continue its mission. Back in Manhattan, the bomb that Lucky created blew up and killed Stuart. Lucky was upset that Stuart almost made him blow up the Empire State Building. The planet shaper began the process of terraforming Venus. At some point, it would finish and put machines in place to continue the process and move on to Earth. They then got the idea to send Richard with his explosives on a Archie shuttlecraft into the damaged section of the planet shaper to set them and hopefully he can do some more damage to the planet shaper. With an Archie pilot, Richard was able to get into the hole in the side of the planet shaper and place the explosives. And as he came back to the shuttle, he saw that there was other shuttles that looked just like Archie shuttles that came out of the planet shaper and were firing at them. That's when the explosive detonated. Richard and the shuttle he was in did not escape. They died. When Matt confronted the Archie captain about what Richard saw, the Archie captain admitted that a very long time ago, the Archies created the planet Shaper and they have been trying to destroy it ever since. The planet Shaper, although damaged, was still doing its job. It finished its job with Venus, left machines to continue the work and headed off towards Earth. So they got another idea. First, they sent the shuttlecrafts out to damage one of, one of its sensors both of them if possible, but they were only able to damage one. They then used the bubble material that they used to create the domes, made it reflective and wrapped it around the planet shaper. So while they were trying to make the bubble material reflective, the planet shaper headed to Earth, reached Earth and began shooting flares down at the planet. Then the planet shaper must have realized that it was the ship following it that was causing all the problems and began attacking the Archie ship, which damaged it. Now the planet shaper stopped seeding Earth and began pursuing the Archie ship. That's when the remaining shuttlecraft began wrapping the bubble material around the planet shaper. With the planet shaper inside the bubble, which quickly adhered to its surface, it could not use any of its engines. They then used the shuttlecraft to push it towards the sun. Once the planet shaper got close to the sun, the bubble vaporized and the planet shaper exploded. Once all the cheering had stopped, the Archie captain thanked Matt and the crew and said, they have no experience in putting cities back where they came from, so what should they do first? And that's how the book ends. As always, I want to thank you for watching and listening, and I want to ask you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up and hit the notification bell, and I will see you in the next video.